so what I'm going to what I'm going to do here is um, j just take you through some of it, uh, from a sort of personal perspective what are the innovations that core has produced in the teaching and pedagogic world and uh, to to set the scene as it were for the sessions that follow which are, which are really directed at trying to get you to think about how you can teach differently with with this set of resources uh, so uh, and let me let me first of all before i before i just describe uh, a few of the things that that are in these slides just to say that uh, reiterate the fact that i'm i run an organization called the economics network which many of you will will know about and we've jointly organized this uh, workshop with the core project team and the uh, economics network is been, has been set up many, many years ago to improve and enhance economics teaching throughout the sector in, in the UK. And that's one of the reasons why we got so excited about CORE when it came out, because it seemed to us, and it was clear right from the outset, that it was a text that was doing things really quite differently and therefore opened up a number of possibilities for teaching that we didn't see in the previous text, or at least in traditional texts, we found that it was a lot more effort to try and do creative teaching in a way that CORE lends itself to quite, quite naturally. So that's where the interest of the Economics Network came in. And so we've been working with the CORE team uh, since then. I've, uh, along with Christian, who's now in the experience room, was involved with writing some of the core resources that sit around a kind of satellite around the core uh, text itself. And so I'll describe some of that in just a moment. Uh, later on, um, Sam and Wendy at various points are going to talk about what is new in core from a uh, content and pedagogic viewpoint. And, and I'm not going to say an enormous amount about that here, but we are starting to describe core as a new paradigm, and that's quite a bold claim. And so I thought I'd just start by pinning down some of the aspects of what that claim would entail, so that it, it would set the scene for why we think this is a kind of bold uh, initiative in, in the teaching of economics. So, I've just outlined here four things that I think would constitute a new paradigm for the education of economics. And I think all of these are in some sense found within the core project. First of all, a new content. So when I say a new content, this is not newly uh, researched or invented content, but it's new content for first year economics teaching. And I won't say much about that because Sam and Wendy will go into that in a, a, a little bit later. But just to give you some of the headlines, what we're saying here is that this is a content which puts uh, power, institutions, imperfect competition, incomplete information, uh, problems with contracts at the core of its teaching, which, which was never the case previously in traditional economics uh, teaching at this level. Secondly, that there... To package this new content, there has to be a new way of organising it, a new set of theoretical and analytical frameworks. And that also you find in CORE. And for those of you who are new to CORE, which I, 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 is most of you in this room, it may be something of a challenge to understand why some of your the models you may have been teaching are not found in CORE in quite the same way. So some of the diagrams that your students will be familiar with aren't there. Uh, or, or they're there in a slightly different, different form. So there is a new conceptual framework for the presentation of this newly thought uh, content. And then thirdly, uh, CORE allows for a new way for students to interact with the material. Right from the outset, it was an online project. It contained multimedia assets. It contained quizzes. It emphasised the importance of data manipulation. It emphasised the importance of games and experiments and the generation of data in the process of teaching. So the way students interact with the content is quite different to the way that you may have been used to when you've done certainly what I was used to when I used to teach economics uh, at the first level. And, and, and you know, I taught economics for uh, close to 20 years before I started teaching core. And, and it really was uh, the first time that my teaching had shifted 
in, 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 in a kind of step change way. And then finally, it gives a new way for teachers to interact with students. And um, so your position as a teacher when you're faced with a core material is likely to be different than it has been previously when you've been imparting information to students using the traditional textbooks. And I'll say a little bit more about that in just a moment. So you could uh, repackage those four elements of what might constitute the new features of, of a textbook like Core as a set of questions. So you might ask, what is different in Core? That's the content question. You know, what is it that, that is different in, in the models that we teach compared to the traditional textbooks, uh, the Varians, the Perlovs, and, and, and so on? And then secondly, how differently does Core approach the material? So how does it package the material? What are the models that it's using? Thirdly, what does Core allow your students to do with this material? And uh, fourthly, how can Core change the way that you present the material to students and the way that you engage in the classroom? And um, th this workshop is intended to touch on all of these areas quite deliberately. So for example, the last one of these, if we're starting to behave differently in the classroom with our students because we're doing different things than we've ever done before, it may pay to think about how we stand in the classroom, how we present ourselves and how we sort of move around the classroom in physical space. So we have a session later on by a trained actor who will talk about some of these things. So this is a holistic workshop which covers uh, all, all of these different aspects. And as you've heard earlier, um, Fabio will later on present something about how you make content come alive by, uh, by kind of creating things in, in, in the classroom with students, for, for example. So that's the scope of the new paradigm. That's the scope of what we're going to uh, we'll talk about in this workshop. So. Just to say something about the overarching approach of CORE, which I think uh, probably in a nutshell will define the difference between CORE and many of the ways that we have been teaching, certainly from a personal perspective, the way that many of us have been teaching economics for a long time. CORE is essentially uh, empirical. It's essentially driven by the real world and people mention this in their introductions that that's what they find that's what they found most refreshing about core was that it kept that relationship in view it kept what you were trying to explain in view as you went through the more theoretical and abstract models you never lost sight of why you were doing those things and that's something that we're going to pick up on so it is a it's economics as empirical it's economics as challenge based so in other words students should always know why, they're on, why you are trudging through certain material. What is the endpoint that you're trying to achieve? And that needs to stay at a close distance, and it does in core. We never move too far away from the end point of this sort of empirical analysis that students are intending to try and explain and uncover here. And it's curiosity driven. So, and I'll say a little bit more about this in just a moment, but Core works well if you teach it in a certain way, which is to say it raises certain questions. It looks at data, it raises certain questions, and then it asks, how are we going to address these questions? What models do we need to understand them? And what can we dispense with? And that question of dispensing with material is something that many new teachers of Core find difficult because Core doesn't teach stuff that is not necessary to do the exp explanation. Whereas many traditional texts introduce a whole set of models, some of which students never really use in explaining everything. And I'll say a little bit more about that in, in, in just a moment as well. If you think about this, this is what research, this is how research works in economics. You tend to look, much research tends to look at an empirical phenomenon that needs explaining or that raises certain questions, piques the interest of a researcher, raises their curiosity, and they rise to the challenge. This is essentially teaching through a frame or a process frame uh, that is quite common to empirical researchers. So uh, I have here some children, a cat, 
and some researchers. <laughs> Core uh, uses uh, the method of curiosity. These are all, these are all uh, people and animals that are very, very curious. It's a very natural thing to do. When you find something that you don't quite understand, it, it challenges you a bit, you want to find out more. For me, at least, the big difference that Core makes is that my students are motivated now in a way that they never were before. And the reason they're motivated is because I'm not saying let's learn some abstract theory and later on we'll apply it. What we're saying to the students is, look at this data. What kind of questions does it raise in your mind? And now let's think about which theoretical frameworks that we absolutely need to be able to explain that. And it's a really very different way of approaching the material. And I, and I think if you look at textbooks side by side and then you look at the core materials, you'll see that straight away, that there's a very, very big difference in the sequencing and orientation of the questions that we're asking students to think about. So, uh, and, 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 and hence the cats and the children. So, if you're starting with data, if you're starting with empirical phenomena, and if you're challenging students to think about questions that need answering, you are inviting them to do something. And that is, again, one of the big steps forward, I think, that CORE, again, for me, takes, which is that it emphasises that students need to do something with this problem that they face. They see some data, you show them some data, it raises questions in their mind. And then you ask them to do something about it. How are they going to bridge that gap? That, 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 that area that of, of unexplained phenomena in the data, how are they going to do that? What are you going to get them to do so they can start becoming researchers, in a sense, looking at the data, thinking about these new models, trying to apply them? It's very much an, an, an applied approach uh, to teaching. And as I say, many of the sessions today and tomorrow will all be about how you get your students to do things not how you explain the material better. And, and, and that, again, is, is, is a fundamental difference, I think, in the way that CORE uh, approaches uh, education in, in economics. Now, so let me just say something about active learning, because this is all about active learning and doing economics. And by the way, doing economics is the name of the new project. No surprise that the CORE project should have ended up creating a set of resources in a website called Doing Economics. Because at its heart, that's what the uh, project has, has has been pushing towards all along. Let's get our students to do some economics. Let's get our students to do something. And then those of you uh, who, like me, pay attention to some of the more abstract educational literature will know that this idea about active learning has been around in the literature for really quite some time. And actually, when you start looking at it, you realize that active learning is not just something that appeared in the last three decades. It may actually be the original form of, teach, of learning. I mean, this is how people traditionally learned. You know, we, we get so used to thinking of the lecture as a traditional form of teaching and then active learning as something that now comes after it. But, but actually, um, the lecture has a history which possibly goes back to around the kind of medieval times. And it's, if you look at the etymology of the word lecture, lecturing is about reading. It's actually reading a script. And that's what it was originally intended to do, was to preserve these sacred scripts from generation to generation, because at that time, there was a risk they could get lost, burned, or whatever. Uh, and so you had to keep that oral tradition alive. And then lecturing changed. It became more about what the lecturer, how the lecturer interpreted the material, and how you created a conversation between academics and students about the material, rather than the importance of just presenting the material. So lecturing has changed. And part of what we're going to try and describe over the next two uh, days is that lecturing is changing again. It's not that lecturing is becoming outmoded completely and we need to do away with it for this new thing called active learning. It's that we need to rethink what technology around us, what new ways of thinking about economics invite us to do when we're faced uh, in, in, in a classroom with, with our students in a lecture kind of situation. So that's, that's the imperative for uh, active uh, learning. And there is, um, there's a lot of literature on this. 
Uh, and, and I've just referenced here something by uh, Prince, which is from the engineering literature. It's quite a good sort of meta study of, uh, of active learning, uh, what, what it means, what it does, and some of the evidence for its, uh, for its learning effects. And um, it, you, you, it, active learning is a very uh, broad set of things, and um, it's hard to define. Uh, although, for the purposes of what we're doing here, I, I think it may be useful to think about it in terms of these five categories, four of which come from the Prince paper. Uh, and so active learning can be active learning in lectures. And that's one of the things that we're going to be talking about. What can you get your students to do in the lectures rather than just listen to you? And one of those things can actually just be note-taking. There's a very good tradition in, in the literature about the importance of note-taking. Because when you have to take notes, you're having to do an act of translation and relate the material to something that you already know. That's the point at which learning happens. So one way of actually activating learning in a lecture is just to stop. Because the moment you stop and you create a little bit of a silence, it forces the students' minds to start thinking. And then if you ask them to write down what they've just heard, that's a form of active learning. So active learning is not necessarily scary. It doesn't mean you have to throw away everything that you've already uh, always done. It just means, at the margin, perhaps, changing some of the ways that you might approach the traditional, uh, to traditional ways of learning. Um, collaborative learning. We know that working in teams, working in groups, is both an authentic activity, so this is what people have to do in their jobs in the real world when they get there, but it's also a, a, a very important way of, of peer learning. Uh, it's active. People are doing things with the data, uh, in, in the case of economics, with data. Uh, there's, a, there's a very slight difference in collaborative learning and cooperative learning. And you might think about um, uh, uh, co collaborative learning as team-based, where you might even assess as a team, uh, or uh, cooperative learning, where you work together, but then you might be doing things on your own and being assessed on your own. So there's a very kind of subtle difference there. But the point here is that activity often happens in groups. So it makes sense to encourage that. Problem-based learning, that term has already been mentioned, and, 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 and um, some of our colleagues here, um, I think they're in the experience group, mentioned um, problem-based learning. So we'll, we'll say something about problem-based learning, because that fits so well with the core methodology, which is to say, here is a problem, here is a challenge. What are we going to do about it? It's a very motivating way, way of teaching. And then specific to economics is games and experiments, which uh, Umberto uh, is going to talk about uh, tomorrow. Um, this is a very economic-specific opportunity for us to get students doing things. The really real beauty of games and experiments is not just that students are performing and acting and doing things and, and thereby kind of embedding it. When you play a game with students, they very rarely forget it and they'll remember the content that was attached to it that you might describe later on. Um, but the other real benefit of games and experiments in the economics classroom is that you can generate data. When you play a game, it automatically generates data. You can then use that to compare it against other studies. In Unit 4 of CORE, uh, we, we've been doing that at Bristol very successfully. We play the public goods game with a pack of cards. In fact, I've played it with 500 students because you don't actually need a pack of cards. You just need them to select two cards so you can do it with clickers. But you can generate lots of information about the way students behave when they're asked to contribute to a public good. And you can compare it to the international evidence that's in core. That's a really fresh way of teaching. So it's the students generating their own data and understanding economics through data that they have performed themselves. It's a very special economics form of, uh, of, of um, active learning. So I just want to now just quickly run through, and then we'll have a bit of a discussion hopefully uh, at, at the end, uh, just run through four principles, and they're not these ones. Um, this is a very Panglossian kind of uh, <laughs> set of principles. Um, and, um, and, and, and I do think uh, much of economics teaching has in the past tried to paint a kind of picture of a pristine world where everything works very, very efficiently and perfectly and welfare outcomes are very, very good. And then, then we tend to talk about market failures and some of the problems that might occur in the real world. 
it's a slightly topsy-turvy way of approaching uh, what, what really should be an empirically focused subject in a world which is not perfect. Right, so I'm going to just describe, uh, and, and, and I, could, I could actually describe a whole set of tips here, but I just want to open the conversation for, to, for today and for this workshop by just, just concentrating on um, four things, I think, um, which, uh, uh, which I think um, are, are, can really help with thinking about how you're going to teach this, uh, this content. So the first is, this is a em very empirically focused uh, text and there are many many I think at the uh, over 200 data sets which are which are associated with core which are downloadable and uh, uh, embedded in the in the text and and in the links on the website and um, you can use that data to motivate and, and I put this as number one because I think that certainly the way I teach core is almost every unit I will start by looking at some data or some phenomenon, some narrative or some story, which is interesting in its own right, but raises a whole set of questions in students' minds. And that's where the motivation comes in. It's the, it's, and, and I've increasingly begun to think of uh, that teaching is very much about information management. You know, you leave something out and it, and it piques someone's interest to find out the thing that you've left out. If you just tell people everything at the outset, they kind of end up a little bit bored, right? So it really is a, a matter of creating a narrative where you create this sense of uh, motivation. So, uh, there, so in Unit 2, for example, those of you who have, have flicked through CORE or have seen it, and I know there will be people here who haven't, haven't yet really opened its pages, but in Unit 2, there's an opportunity, for example, to ask a number of questions that students tend to find very interesting. There are some very interesting graphs. So let me just show you. Um, anyway, in the corner here, you might just be able to see, is um, a graph. And um, what it shows is real wages going back uh, from um, the Middle Ages right the way to 2000. And what you can see is this, th there are two lines, two curves, which, which rise quite sharply towards the end there. And the one that rises, uh, uh, the, the, the one that, um, uh, uh, sorry, so let me just explain some of the features of this. Some of the interesting features of this are that it's flat for a very, very long period and then it rises considerably. Now this is a, a graph of real wages. It's a graph of real, an index of real wages over that period that's been estimated by some economists. And, um, and immediately as students see this, it raises certain questions in their mind. And those questions are, why is it flat for so long? And why does it rise so dramatically towards the end? And why does it rise for some countries first and then other countries later? And it's, this is the kind of thing which is, it's, it's not rocket science, but because you're putting data there right at the outset, right at the front, it raises some interesting questions about how we're going to explain this phenomena. And this next graph here, this is, um, uh, th th so, so by the way, that graph I just showed you is the first figure in, figure in, in unit two. And, and it works as a teaching method to spend some time on that graph and just ask, quest ask students what questions come to their minds, because that's the thing that's going to motivate them to, to, to find the answers. There is then, um, I think this is uh, figure three in the book, which again, you can't see very well there, but so I'll just describe it. What it shows is coal input on the vertical axis and workers on the horizontal axis. And again, these are just, uh, these are just techniques of production. And so you can start to, you can start to get students to, to think about what it is that might, uh, might be driving that sharp rise of wages at the, at, at the uh, um, end of the 19th century by starting to get them to think about how firms, uh, how firms respond, how firms choose amongst different techniques. So why was it that Britain shot up first and then other countries shot up later? What was it about the conditions in Britain which meant that certain techniques here might have been chosen rather than other techniques? And why would that have led to a growth spurt in the UK? Well, it may be because those particular techniques were cheaper than other ones. 
And so even with this, you can start quite a, big, quite a long conversation about how we're going to start thinking through costs, innovation, choice of techniques, the relative conditions at the end of the 19th century or in the, middle, in the, in the end of the 18th century in terms of the number of workers and the opportunities for finding coal in various countries. Um, the, relative costs of, uh, uh, the relative costs of labor and the relative costs of coal, for example. You can move very, very quickly then on to describing ISO costs and what happens when all of a sudden there are discoveries uh, made in coal. There are, there are innovations which make coal mining much, uh, much easier and, 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 and so wages start to rise and what happens to relative input prices as wages start to rise and coal becomes relatively cheaper in the UK compared to in other countries. So you can start furnishing a story, but the point um, I'm making here is that you stay very, very close to this initial graph. Everything that you're doing with input costs, with techniques of production, and with ISO costs, is you keep referring back to this graph because you're trying to explain why the UK, Britain moves first compared to those other countries. Now, you could choose a different set of graphs if you focused on a different area uh, of this graph, uh, which I'll come to in just a moment. And then um, there is, then finally, another graph uh, a little bit later on, which then goes back to the data again. So you started with some data. You said, well, what's interesting about this? Let's do an excursion into theory to try and understand why it might be that things happened in Britain earlier than other countries, something to do with the abundance of coal, something to do with the expense of labour, something to do with the opportunities that technological progress provided in choice of technique. And then you can go back to the data and you can say, well, let's just see whether it's true the, the, that, that, that wages were more expensive relative to capital in the UK compared to some other countries. So here there are some graphs in court to sort of demonstrate that that is, in fact, an empirically verifiable uh, proposition. So you start with data, you move through the theory, staying close to that graph that you're trying to explain, and then you bring it back to the data. So it's a very, very, um, very, very core, core type uh, 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 method of uh, exposition, that. Um, and then there are uh, a whole set of resources. So this one is um, Bob Allen um, talking about why Britain industrialized first. Uh, again, if that's the story you're telling in your teaching, then here's a very useful asset, useful asset that's available through the core text where he will recount in a very expert way the story that I've been, uh, I've been uh, telling just right there. And there's a whole set of these Economists in Action videos all the way through core. And then what about the rest of the unit? You see, that, for me... So you could just go through unit two, going through section by section. It wouldn't be that interesting. But what CORE does is it lends itself to the kind of exposition that I've just explained there, where you start with an empirical phenomenon, you pick students' brains for what questions does it ask, what questions does it raise, you know, what motivates you, and then let's try and answer some of that. Let's show you the usefulness of some of these economic models. And by the way, notice that there were no isoquants there. And I can't, this was the first time in 20 years when I started teaching core that I taught isocosts without teaching isoquants at the same time or shortly thereafter. Why is it not there? Well, the reason it's not there is because it is not necessary to explain the phenomenon that you're trying to explain. It is, in a very real sense, superfluous to the explanation. So why teach it? If later on there is a point at which it becomes important to think about isoquants, then we'll bring it in there. It really is quite a different uh, conception. Right? We've always started, or most of us have started teaching by saying, well, let's lay down the important theoretical aspects that students are going to need, and then let's apply them and pick the ones that are necessary. But what you do sometimes with that methodology is you teach stuff that you're not actually going to use. And students quite rightly might turn around and say, well, God, I'm not sure quite why we learned that in the first year. Never used it again. So it's a kind of just-in-time teaching. Right? Here's an empirical phenomenon. Let's do just those bits that are necessary to help you understand it. 
it's, 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 I like to think of this as the slightly topsy-turvy way of teaching, but actually it's the right way of teaching, it seems to me, and the way that we've traditionally done it may be topsy-turvy. Well, can I ask, I mean, I don't want to disrupt it a lot, but this one is the first one that hit me. That's fine for the master students, and I also agree, and we said from the beginning of when I considered this bold adventure that's been going on for a decade, that the trouble with UK economics is that we teach everybody as if they're going to do a PhD. And I accept that that's not right, and I get angry that we teach econometrics that way and so on. However, if you don't do isochrons and you do, we don't change it upstream yet, we have at LSE 25% of students who will be out of their depth and water doing all kinds of graduate programs, not just economics, but finance and uh, entrepreneurship, because they don't know an isochron. I mean, in that way. So where do we put it in? Is, uh, it's just a question. You don't have to okay, no, answer. I, I, I think we have to bear it in mind, this, sure. this multi-track. I'm sure Bristol has it. So, no, no. And, and, and I, I, send them to Bristol. I, I will answer. <laughs> I, I, will, I will answer that question because I think it, it's, an, it's one that, you know, anyone who teaches uh, where there are gaps has to think about, well, I, I, which of these things are necessary? I mean, I mean, by the way, you know, there are no LM curves in core. Uh, there's no marginal well, productivity. So I, I happen, that's another question. I really disagree with that one. The, but, but that's another question. And, and I'll address your question head what on, I mean actually. But I, just I think that that's a question of what I would call that <coughs> I'm still worried. That's all I'm saying. I'm, I'm trying to do it from the point of view of wanting to use core. And okay. I see that the ISLM attitude, which I heard Ch uh, Padma Chowdhury say, no self-respecting person uses ISLM curves at, at a meeting I was at with students. And <coughs> I Googled Krugman on why do you use ISLM curves. And I decided that, in fact, what you're doing is narrow. You know, that is you're taking one view, which is held strongly by people, but you don't even have a little footnote saying... Okay. So, what so I get what you're getting at. I'll, 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 I, uh, yes, no, I, I will come to. That. So let me just let me just um, address the the kind of philosophical problem here because there are lots of things which are not uh, traditionally that are traditionally in textbooks which are not found in course. The marginal productivity theory of labour. So, so let so let me just explain um, why, and 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 again, this is something. It's a personal view of mine, but it seems to me that teaching now in the twi in the 21st century. Um, is not about teaching everything. Um, it's yeah. about teaching students, getting students to a point where if they need something, they are able to fill in the I gaps. And, and so, the, so my answer to you about isoquants is, if they need them later, that's the point at which to learn them, because that's when they will learn them well. And I, and I sometimes worry that we teach a lot of material which isn't brought... To, alive in a meaningful sense and so students have learned it in some sense but they are going to have to relearn it at the point where they need to use it. We have it. a double problem in economics so I'm really supporting you on this which is that sometimes they have to learn it because we learn it right and, and therefore uh, we could change it upstream because we could stop teaching things that are superfluous. Okay, and boy, does that mean 90% of economics is micro. And there may be. So, right. Steffi, do you want to come in? Yeah, I, I guess the issue here is not, and I agree, and I think I really struggle with completely move to core at Warwick because of that. However, I think the issue is then with the master or with the future programs because, sorry, because at that point my problem is why we just don't teach it at the master when they actually need it. So, but if I'm a teaching a master course, my assumption is, well, you know all these things from your undergrad. So I think yeah. We need to change those things to move on it, it is, and revise yes. all our master yeah. or postgraduate studies. In that and and the, other, the other thing I just quickly mentioned in passing is that we think that we need to teach this stuff um, or the students won't know it. Isoquants aren't that difficult. If you've, if you've learned what's in core, students can teach themselves that at the point where they need it. I don't think, you know, we need, it's not a problem that we're going to have to waste time at the masters. Anyway, let me let me just um, let me just sidestep that for the moment. Just just to mention that the that the the, the 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 in terms of the pedagogical method here, we have used just that part of the theoretical framework that we need in order to make the empirical explanation. That's a method of teaching which which appeals to students uh, and and makes sense. You could go further. You could go further and start going into the mathematics of uh, isocost curves. You could fill it out with isoquants. 
But you don't have to do that. That's the point about teaching in this way. You can go as far as you want into the theoretical framework, but you must go some way into it to be able to do the explanation. And, and that's, where, uh, that's where all students need to know. Whether you, in your own courses, go further than that is entirely up to you. And CORE allows for that to happen. There's no reason why you can't teach isoquants in CORE if you really want to. So, what, what, what happens then? I mean, for me, that actually packages quite nicely what I want to teach in Unit 2. But then there's another part of that. Um, there's another part of that graph that we started with, which is also interesting, which is this flat bit here. So then you can have another section to Unit 2 if you wanted to and ask the question, why did nothing happen to wages for centuries? And this is where you might teach um, average products of labor and the Malthusian uh, mechanism. And it's a very useful uh, thing to do because it's a useful way of having a methodological discussion, which again is not something we typically do in a first level course in economics. So the question here is, if there's a model that explains those few hundred years there, why did it suddenly stop working? What is it about models that mean that they can work, sometimes for centuries and centuries, and then all of a sudden they break down? That's a deep methodological and philosophical question that isn't usually addressed in a, in a first level course. Uh, and so something about uh, the exogen, the, 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 the variables outside the modeling, model changing really quite significantly. What were they? What caused the Malthusian mechanism to stop working? Again, this is a motivating way of getting into really what is quite an abstract problem. And the reason it's motivating is because you can see it breaking down. We're not just saying there are things called models and sometimes they don't work. That's a very abstract way of, of, of exposition. Here, you see a model working very well or explaining something very well, and then all of a sudden it fails to explain. And so there's something new to be explained, which is why did it break down? Right? Do you know that, uh, to support that, I learned in my uh, post-Asian crisis when I worked at the UN briefly, um, that um, the forecasting experts who gathered every year in Oslo, they explained that our models always break down at those points when we need them. Yeah. <laughs> that is a guarantee to, and that 1997, 1998 was part of that. You didn't have to wait till 2008, the 10 years before, the models also broke down at that point. That they will break down exactly, and macro and, models I'm only talking and, about. Obviously. And absolutely. But and macro it, models it, will, bro will break down yeah. when you need them. And it's something, there's something <laughs> nice about seeing that in a time series right. horizon. Uh, if we'd had that, maybe we wouldn't have been so confident when we were accused of overconfidence. Now, I thought, and this has kind of started already, I thought that somebody would sort of uh, turn around and start saying... I can date when my sister does. You're kidding. Are you kidding me, man? What, are you kidding me? You're kidding me. you got to be kidding me. Are you kidding me? It goes on like that, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop it. But I thought somebody was going to say, and I, and, I, and I guess this has sort of started. It's like, well, the thing about Chapter 2, the thing about Unit 2, is that it is... Um, bear with me. The thing about Unit 2 is that it's quite easy to teach because it's got such a compelling narrative. And so you, you might be thinking, yeah, but, you know, that's easy. You can always tell us about Unit 2. But are you kidding me? You know, there's, there's stuff to learn. You know, there is, there are, the, the, there's the intertemporal model of consumer choice to be taught to students, right? There are, there are some really hard stuff to be taught. So I thought what I would do is just, um, uh, just go on to my second principles. So the first is to use data for motivational purposes. The second one is to, 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 to really embrace this movement from the complex to the simple. And, um, and I'm going to use not an obviously simple chapter like chapter two, but something which is more bread and butter. And I have to say, I taught, um, this, so unit seven is what I'm going to talk about. Unit seven is uh, the, model, the, the model of the firm, the theory of the firm, the pricing decision, right? And, and, and I have to say, when I, I, when I used to teach this, it was the most boring part of the course. Right. You cost curves, um, different kinds of cost curves, firm shutdown decisions, all of those sorts of things. You, you know, used to, used to send me to sleep, right? 
And um, uh, so, so who knows what the, what the students were thinking. So if you can do it with something like this, if you can find a motivating way of teaching this, then I think you've got something cracked in the way that, uh, the way that we, we, we um, uh, approach teaching at this level. So let me just go back. The way I used to teach it was we would talk about cost curves. We would talk about short-run cost curves. We would talk about average costs, marginal costs, total costs. Uh, we'd talk about the distinction between fixed costs and variable costs. Um, uh, we would talk about the short run, we would talk about the long run. We would do all of that. We didn't necessarily find a comparing, compelling narrative from any empirical reality, but even if you did that, it's a fairly boring set of, <laughs> it's a fairly boring sequence you just have to go through. You're collecting a whole set of theories. And it takes quite a long while. I mean, I don't know how long I used to spend. I used to spend a few weeks, I think, going through all of that kind of stuff, bringing it all together in the theory of perfect competition and so on. That methodology is starting with simple building blocks and then building it up to a kind of complex model and then using that complex model to explain what is essentially a very complex reality. There's nothing fundamentally wrong with that. It kind of works if you can hold students' attention long enough. Cord does things really quite differently to that, which is kind of in the way that I've described it in the previous unit, that you start with the complex reality, and then you say, what do we absolutely need to be able to explain this? And that might mean some of those simple building blocks we don't bother with for now. We might come back to them later on. And so unit seven is bread and butter stuff. This is the theory of the firm. This is, this is about profit maximization and costs. And... Um, you know, as I say, we often start uh, with, as I've written here, we often start with perfect competition because we think, well, that's the benchmark model. And then you think, well, what is it a benchmark of? And it's, it's a very odd benchmark because it's not, like all benchmarks, it's not, it's not uh, real. But, it, but benchmarks give this impression that they're somehow desirable. And actually, this is a very cutthroat form of competition, right? Where everybody knows what everybody else is doing and thinking. <laughs> it's a kind of fairly dystopian sort of vision of the world. But that's where we tend to start. And then we say, but actually, in the real world, firms have power. And as Adam Smith said, you know, they hold secrets from each other and, and so on. And we start going, moving towards this reality that we're trying to explain. Again, let's just suppose we flipped that. What would the world look like? What would the teaching uh, uh, of, of this look like? So in this, in this um, uh, you see, this time it works. I don't understand. That's what should have happened when I pressed the, uh, pressed, clicked on the previous diagram. Um, you do see a demand curve. We start with this demand curve in Unit 7, and, but it's an empirical demand curve. This is an estimated demand curve based on willingness to pay. And there's a very, students understand that concept really very readily. Right? How much would you be willing to pay uh, uh, you know, how, many, how much would you be willing to buy at this price? How much would you be willing to buy at this price? So you've got to trace out an empirical uh, demand curve for Cheerios. Now, the, um, the firms that you see at the beginning here are Cheerios. You see Walmart. You see a whole number of different firms. All of these firms are generally quite big. They're not the atomized, tiny firms that you see in perfect competition. The reason why that works is because students have... A, 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 a realistic example that they can attach to here. Everybody knows about the Walmarts, right? Everybody knows about the Microsofts and the Apples, and everybody knows about these firms that sell Cheerios and so on. So this is a, a, this, these are real firms that we can start the discussion with. If we can start thinking about how they behave, then we can start saying, well, what happens in a kind of more weird world where there's no power? It doesn't happen anywhere, really. But what about a really weird world where there's no power um, and everybody knows everybody else, what everybody else is doing and thinking? It's a horrible kind of dystopian vision. I don't know if you've seen Black Mirror or uh, Handmaid's Tale. Perfect competition makes me think a little bit of those kinds of scenarios. But, you know, what happens if we strip away the power? What happens if we strip away the problems of uh, information and so we have this really, really weird world, then what happens? That's when you get perfect competition. So perfect competition drops out quite easily at the end of this, almost as an aside. But that's not what, we, what I used to do before. I used to spend weeks on perfect competition. 
And what would it be telling the students there? That this is the desirable state of the world? Or this is how the world works? So, so you know, there is, there, is, there is more to it, I think, than just motivation. I think there is a sort of ethical point here as well, which is that we normalise, you know, with prioritising and sequencing, we tend to normalise the states of the world that we're talking about. If you talk about the real world, students are motivated and they think, well, that's what reality is actually like. If you start with perfect competition, they might be demotivated because they can't relate to anything and they start to think that's what the world should be like, but it isn't and we should be trying to get it more like that. I'll, I'll, I'll leave you to think about the, um, those, uh, those things. So what happens then? We move from this um, demand schedule and we start thinking about costs and, and profits. And we start saying, well, we've already had this empirical story about firms um, innovating, new technologies, uh, searching after economic rents. That story is all back there in Unit 2. We've already talked about that. So we can go back there. It's one of the really neat things about core is you can keep using the same empirical phenomenon. What was it about firms that made them strive to, uh, to, to innovate, do better than other firms? What, what is it about capitalist firms that, 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 that makes them do that? Well, it's the search for profits. It's the search for economic rents. And uh, this demand curve is something that everybody can relate to. So you can move very quickly from this demand curve, as, as, as happens in, in Unit 7, to starting to think about how do we start representing profits. You can trace from this demand curve with some thinking about costs, because we've talked about ISO costs already, so the students will know about costs. You can start talking about profits, and then you can start tracing out the ISO profit curve. Again, this is something that CORE does that I haven't seen in other textbooks. Other textbooks tend to go very quickly to the MR equals MC condition for profit maximization. And here's another example of something that can really quickly turn students off. Because MR equals MC is a mathematical derivation of an optimization problem. It doesn't have a natural counterpart in reality. You know, it doesn't have a natural intuitive interpretation in terms of profits. If you're starting a story about the Industrial Revolution and you're saying what drives firms to act like this is the search for profits, then it makes sense to talk about firms in terms of profits. So we sketch out the ISO profit function and we say this is what firms are trying to maximise. Two benefits of that. One, it stays close to the empirical story about the search for profits. Um, and the second one is, pedagogically, it's the same framework that they've already seen because in units three, they will have seen the indifference curve and, and um, feasible set framework, which is kind of trying to do as well as you can given a constraint. And this is the same problem. It even looks very much the same when you sketch out the ISO profit function. So it's not the kind of bizarre thing that CORE does, that it, that it ditches MR equals MC. Well, it doesn't actually, that, that it kind of relegates it somewhat and it brings in this kind of new framework to discuss firm pricing decisions. But, but it, it does it for a purpose because it, you can remain very close to the story that you want to tell. And I'm starting to sketch this idea that there is a story that you want to sort of tell in core, and that's what keeps your students motivated and interested. If you teach economics as a set of atomized theories, which you're then gonna to bring together in some kind of synthetic moment at the end, you probably will find students turn off more readily than if you're trying to tell a story about an empirical phenomenon, even if it goes back to the 19th century, as I've been emphasizing here. So uh, the isoprofit curve then, as I've written here at the top, is a response to the question that's already been talked about in core. And that's the point I want to make again, which is that if you can teach core as some really interesting problems, for which we can pluck out some interesting theories to help us in explaining them, then that really works in terms of uh, motivation. Um, so, 
there's a lot of text here. I'll give you the link, so uh, I'm not going to go through all this. But um, I will just pause on section 7.7 .7 because that story is the one I tell about search for profits, how do firms do this, uh, and we sketch out the ISA profit for, uh, curves. And, and of course, you end up with the same condition, MRS equals MRT, so you can relate that back to something they've seen before as well. But there's a very important section, which is section 7.7, .7, where I kind of pause and I spend a bit of time on that. Because the interesting thing about starting with firms that have power is you end up with an equilibrium. But that equilibrium is not uh, Pareto efficient in the sense that there are mutual, mutually beneficial trades that have not been realized in the outcome. And students will see that again when they do the labor market. They will see that the equilibrium of the labor, part, labor market results in unemployment. But that's the way the world is. It's still an equilibrium. In fact, it's a Nash equilibrium, but there is unemployment. It's a different labor model to the one we typically taught where the market clears. And they think, well, actually, that doesn't happen. How do I then explain unemployment? And then you have to have some extra kind of theoretical baggage in order to do that. So this is where it starts, in a sense. The imperfect competition here generates an equilibrium outcome where the market doesn't do, isn't perfect. And that's really quite liberating for students because then it says, then it asks questions in students' mind. Can we do better than this? Why is it not perfect? Is it something to do with the distribution of power? Can that be altered? Of course it can. It can be altered by institutions and governments. These questions don't arise naturally in the course of teaching perfect competition. They arise naturally if you start with real firms in real competition, which, by the way, is where Adam Smith started, right? There's nothing in Adam Smith about kind of free flows of information or perfection in, in that sense. It's something we invented much later um, in order to solve mathematically intractable problems, not because we wanted to explain <laughs> reality. So, very important section, and, and I'll just refer here to unit uh, 11 as well, and, and 12, which are on market failure, because the core approach, by saying that we are going to address markets where there is incomplete information, where there is imperfect competition, uh, where contracts can't be specified perfectly. It means that markets don't work perfectly, by definition. And so there's always a role. There's, there's always, A, a role for policy, and B, there's always a consideration of power and inequality that arises naturally. And so those themes run all the way through core. Market failure, or the, I, th I think the term is unfortunate, but market failure in core is a standard outcome. It's not something that is a perversity of a perfect, perfect outcome. It's the normal thing. The perfection is a kind of byproduct when you assume away all these real problems. That's the right way, it seems to me, to teach economics, right? It's not some kind of odd uh, reconfiguration of, of, of the subject. OK, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going I'm to try and wrap up now. Just two more. I said I had four principles. I'm just going to talk about two others. Let me just recount. It makes sense in core to use data as your motivating principle. Find those gaps that are going to excite students and pique their interest. Secondly, it probably makes sense to try and avoid this method where you build up building blocks slowly and build something up. Rather, go straight in with the complex problem, with the imperfections, and, and teach it that way. It's more motivating, and it, and it has uh, many, many other benefits to do with students' appreciation of what markets are there for and what they can do for us. It's, it's a much more realistic kind of approach. Now, this is, uh, we're in Bristol, so I thought it's only right to show you a picture of the Clifton Suspension Bridge. But I, 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 I do it just to um, point out that uh, this approach of moving from complex to simple um, has a kind of engineering analogy because we have often taught economics by sort of spending a lot of time on these foundations. So students can't see the wonderful thing that's going to come at the end, right? And that can be demotivating. Another way of thinking about the same problem is to say, well, let's assume the bridge is already there. And let's now try and understand what keeps it up, right? And, and you know, I might be stretching a point here, but I think that's the difference in terms of keeping students interested is that you can see the bridge, and we can still study these foundations, we can still think about what it is that holds that thing up without having to start with no bridge and then slowly construct it over a period of, of, of years. So make use of the modularity 
and the data sets in core. That's my third tip here, which is to say that there are lots, core has a lot of uh, different types of uh, uh, resources. So I've mentioned here on, in, in this, this section here that um, there are Leibniz, what are called Leibniz supplements, and I'll show you the website in just a moment. Leibniz supplements, there are games and experiments, there are ideas for games and experiments, there are exercises, there are economists in action videos, there are, whole, there are lecture slides, there are all kinds of resources that are available. And what I would suggest, and we started, I started earlier on today by saying that this is a gigantic text, and it's not even all, all the material is not even in here, and now there's another text, and there's also the Doing Economics site. So you need to be kind of judicious in the way that you use this. I personally wouldn't say start at the beginning and just go through bit by bit. Think about the story you want to tell. What are the empirical hooks? And, um, and use those to select what you're going to do. Use the theories, just enough of the theory to make sure students understand what it needs to be explained, what needs to be explained. And then they can use the other bits to flesh out the more difficult detail. If you have very mathematically oriented students, get them to look at the Leibniz's to understand the mathematics of isocos curves, the mathematics of isoprofit curves and so on. You can go that bit further, but you don't have to do that. It's, a, it's, it's an increasingly modular format core, and, and, that, and that, um, that can really, really help in organising your teaching. Um, you can use data sets, uh, get students to do things. There's lots of stuff about inequality. You can get them to download data sets, calculate Gini coefficients. These are the things we now do routinely um, in, in Bristol and some of the other universities that are, uh, that are uh, looking at this, this text. I mean, you know, we talked about wage data. Well, why just look at the UK? Why not get students to, to, to find out if it's true of other countries? What might the stories be there? Why do, they, why do they differ? Modularity also lends itself very well to techniques of problem-based learning as well, because the resources are there, and uh, Fabio and others will describe some of these later on. And, and flipping as well. Flipping is this idea that you do a lot of, you get students to do some of the work before, and then you use the lecture to discuss it. Um, and again, because the stuff is interesting enough for students to do, and there's enough of it there, you can select um, appropriate material to help you help you do that. So, um, and then my fourth one is use um, repetition to your advantage um, in teaching of core. A core is quite a cohesive text, and, and I'm somewhat surprised at how cohesive it is, given that it's now so voluminous and there's lots of resources. But it still manages to retain. Um, the, the, the kind of driving forces that inform it, which are, you know, there is imperfect competition everywhere. There, is, um, there are informational issues everywhere. Uh, we look at institutions. The history is always on the horizon. The environment is always on the horizon. There's always uh, some thinking about inequality. Um, outcomes are almost always not perfect, and so there might be some role for policy and for institutions. And so um, one of the things that CORE has done if you go to the website, is that it has colour-coded a number of themes. So these themes, and they're not the only themes that run through core, but these themes run through all of core. Global economy, inequality, innovation, politics and policy, right, the need for policy to improve potentially outcomes, environment, history, instability and growth. Um, and so this helps you think about that narrative that you're telling. If you look at the, you know, the pink colours, I think, are policy, I think, and if you look at all the pink dots through core, you've got essentially another textbook within core which tells the story of instability. You could use that to your advantage. You can use it in constructing a course. You can construct a course where inequality becomes an important aspect of what you're asking students to do and what you're talking about in classes and so on by just looking at the bits that, that refer to, uh, to, to inequality. There are, from chapter six, 17 onwards, what we call capstone units. So there's a whole chapter bringing together everything in inequality and discussing it in more depth. So there are stories and themes running through core. And, and my, my personal suggestion is, is to make use of those in the way you organize the course and to move away from this idea that we're teaching just a bunch of theories to we're trying to explain certain phenomena. And again, comprehensiveness is not, to, for, to my mind, in, that important. You could do a very good course around one or two of these themes that would touch on most of the theoretical framework that's in core. 
And students would therefore be excellently trained first-year economists, but they haven't done the whole of core. And so just go, going back to a discussion we were having earlier, it is not increasingly, I think, in teaching, it is recognized across uh, the field of higher education. Comprehensiveness is not what we should be aiming for. We should be equipping students to be able to find and understand the information as and when they need it. So, so, so my suggestion to you would be to think about the story you want to tell and be selective about the way that you, uh, that, that you use core. So I'll give you a link to these slides. I've got, uh, you know, at the bottom here, I've just got a few questions that, for example, suppose you were interested in, um, in uh, uh, inequality. Um, you know, here's a whole set of questions which you could ask students as the course progresses. Why did wages rise at the end of the 19th century? Well, we looked at that. Uh, what are the implications for inequality of such a wage increase, both between wages and profits, but between workers who are employed, workers who aren't, different types of workers? How would we measure inequality? Lots of stuff you could do around that. Is it fair? Is inequality fair? There's a whole section in core about fairness concepts. Uh, but, but all of these things are motivated by these real questions that students may have a burning desire to understand. Uh, how do workers benefit from increases in income? So in other words, when increases in income happen, so going back to that graph where wages shot up, what do workers do with that? Do they stop working as much because they're earning a lot more? That's what Keynes thought would happen. Or do they work even harder? That seems to be what's happening. Why? Why do they work harder? Can we explain why that is? What's the theoretical framework we're going to use? But again, that's going to be in difference curves in the labor leisure diagram, but it's motivated by this question and the data shooting up at the end of the 19th century. There's so much you can get from a single graph in core. Um, is GDP growth the same as welfare growth? Right? So incomes rose. GDP of various countries shot up in the Industrial Revolution. Does that mean the welfare of the citizens improved? How would we know that? Are there other ways of measuring welfare uh, growth? Um, and, and so on. Uh, what about unemployment? Is there always unemployment? What does GDP growth mean in the context of unemployment for those unemployed workers? Uh, how does power in the legal context shape how surpluses from economic activity are distributed? That's the, that's the topic of Unit 5. You know, what difference does power make? We move from a kind of slave economy to a sort of shareholding, farming type economy to a wage economy in a single model in Unit 5. But it raises those particular questions. Once we start changing the ownership once we start changing the relationship between people, how does the distribution shift? So we're talking about inequality. How is it related to power and the legal framework? Uh, uh, what can governments do about inequality? Is it the same in all countries? How would we measure that? So, as I say, when I look at CORE, I see a whole set of questions. <laughs> and, and it seems to me that if you can get your students to see CORE as a set of questions, then that is, uh, then you've solved a lot of the problems, I think, that we've traditionally had in motivating students. I will stop. Are there any questions? We'll, um, and, and sorry, I uh, spoke for longer than I thought I would, which is often the case. No. Any suggestions? Can I just ask the difference between the old core and the uh, ESPP in terms of, you talk about units... Yeah, so ESPP is uh, economics for um, economics and society for public policy. I think something something in in, in that area. It is um, it some parts of it are, are sort of reused parts of the original core, or they've been rewritten, reorganised. But it is aimed at. Um, at social science students, and it is even more, I think, database than this one is. So uh, I, think, I think I'm right in saying there will be about 12 units in total, so it's a shorter venture than this. Um, but it is explicitly aimed at, um, at, uh, at, at getting other students of uh, social scientists and beyond, actually. We're going to use it in Bristol with, with all our students. But to get them to understand some um, data, primarily, uh, the difference between causation, correlation, you know, what, what, what should you understand when you look at economic data, but then also to understand something about these um, theoretical models. So, so it is, in a sense, a kind of uh, another core which is aimed at a different audience, whereas the original core, which is this one, is aimed squarely at sort of um, uh, courses for e economists who are going on to do further economics. 
I, look, can I just finish by just pointing you to, if you go to the core website um, and, and click on resources, you will there see a whole set of different resources. And some of those resources are teaching guides. And we've created teaching guides for every unit up to 12, up to 12 is on there at the moment. Four to, four, the next two, up to 14, will be up in the next few days. And then we'll finish off with 15 and 16 pretty soon. But those, those teaching guides are intended to give you some of these kind of hooks. You know, how might you think about teaching this? Um, how might you organize the material? How, how have we done it? Some of the people have been teaching it for some time. What are the, some of the data sets and resources you could use in, in the organization of your teaching? There are lecture slides there as well. There are ideas for playing games and experiments. There's a whole set of resources on that resources website. And then also, there's another website called Doing Economics. You can get to all these websites by going through the main core page. And Doing Economics is a set of empirical problem sets. Where, they, where students do things with economics. And although it, it came out of the Nuffield project and it's sort of, sort of linked to ESPP, which is the new non-economist's text, nevertheless, it's a standalone piece of work. So those are practical data-based exercises. There are, they're kind of worked examples where students do things with Excel or R, if they're more sophisticated with programming. And it takes them through a whole set, um, there's this sort of guidance to work through data-based problems. And you know, people from the ONS might well have contributed or be interested in, in, in that resource there. So have a, have a look at that. Um, we should stop. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>